karting. The most pure, intense and fun form of motorsport there is. Many people don't seem to know anything about this amazing sport however, which is a real shame. If you like racing, competition and sports, this is definitely for you. With so many different options, classes and races to attend, things can get a little bit overwhelming. To keep things simple however, today we're focusing on just three of these. Rental Karting, Tillotson T4 and Rotax Max. Karting is the purest form of motorsport. The vehicles themselves are a perfect representation of that, because they're essentially small race cars with everything you need and nothing you don't. Take my Rotax Max Senior as an example, powered by a 125cc Rotax Max Senior Evo 2 engine. It produces 32 brake horsepower and 21 newton meters of torque, which is quite a lot for a two-stroke engine of this size. The engines are also sealed and there are strict regulations regarding modifying and tuning the engines. The power is transferred to the rear axle via a chain, and the rear axle is essentially a hollow tube connecting the two rear wheels held by two bearings bolted onto the chassis. Speaking of the chassis, it's a simple assembly of welded metal tubes and believe it or not, it's the key player in handling. If you remove all the parts from the chassis, you can also see that there is not much left. The car's wheels have rubber slick tires and magnesium or sometimes aluminium rims. These materials are chosen due to their thermal properties and low weight. Speaking of low weight, the driver sits in a super lightweight and flexible fiberglass seat, crucial for handling as it connects four points of the chassis. Precise seat positioning is vital for optimal car performance, and even a little imperfection in mounting the seat can have disastrous consequences. The chrome bars on the side add stiffness to the chassis, which also changes the handling. If you move a little bit further to the right, we can find a single brake disc mounted on the rear axle. This thing operates pretty much like a car brake. Pressing the pedal creates pressure in the system, forcing the brake pads onto the disc. Simple yet effective, the go-kart is a well-engineered machine where each part plays a specific role in the pursuit of speed. Now that we pretty much know all of the key components of a go-kart, we can see that there is one major difference between a go-kart and a full-sized race car. And that is the solid rear axle. When you have a solid rear axle, both rear wheels are rotating at the same speed at all times. This is fine when you're traveling in a straight line, but once you start cornering, the outside wheel has to cover a greater distance than the inside wheel which means one of the two will be sliding on the surface of the track. They solve this issue in cars by inventing a differential, but go-karts don't have one of these. To address this, go-karts are designed to lift the inside rear wheel during turns, allowing it to rotate freely in the air. This lifting mechanism is facilitated by the chassis design, the second significant difference from race cars. Go-karts lack a traditional suspension, instead the chassis serves this purpose. Its flexibility, all of the components that you can change and put on, directly influences the handling. However, this constant flexing shortens the chassis lifespan. Most go-karts are built to last only two race weekends, and while you can extend their life, one with 20 hours of track time won't handle like a brand new chassis. Anyways, if we look a little bit further to the right, next to my Rotax Max card, we find my Tillotson T4 Senior card. In terms of technical stuff, this card is pretty much the same concept as the one we just looked at. The engine is different however, with it having a 225cc, 17 brake horsepower, 4-stroke engine. Unlike the Rotax Max card we just saw, this thing is built to be a bit cheaper to run, which it does relatively well. There are several slight design changes and differences in regulations to the T4 made to extend this card's lifespan and to keep costs low. This lower cost does come at the cost of performance however, and this card is about 3 to 5 seconds a lap slower than the Rotax Max, depending on the track. The same is once again true for the rental card. A more robust design is made so that these cards can withstand a lot of abuse and don't need maintenance that often. The engines are once again a little bit less powerful, as most rental card engines only have about 6 to 10 brake horsepower. Rental cards are purely meant for arrive and drive purposes, so I won't get into many more technical details since it's not really that important because you cannot change anything on these things, not even the tire pressure. Like the name suggests, it's a rental card, you cannot take it home, it's just there at the track, you rent it for a few minutes and boom, you go off again. A general rule of thumb to follow with different karting classes is, the more money you spend, the faster your race class becomes. Speaking of racing however... So, you've either acquired a kart or are keen to delve deeper into the world of karting. For beginners, rental karting is often the initial step. It's a straightforward process. You show up at the track, pay around 15 to 20 euros and relish about 12 minutes of pure fun. Most cities boast at least one rental car track, either indoors or outdoors, providing a taste of this exhilarating sport. These tracks frequently offer basic lessons, courses and club championships, making them perfect for those on a budget or younger enthusiasts. However, if you decided to invest in a Rotax Max or Tillotson card and wish to experience the track independently, the dynamics change significantly. Unlike rental cards where everything is readily available at the track, Owning your card entails responsibility for transport, maintenance, setup and much more. 
Once you've gathered your tools, spare parts, means of transport, and possibly enlisted the help of a buddy, it's time to hit the track. You load up your van with everything you need and you need to make sure that you don't forget anything. You are literally responsible for bringing every single spare part, every single tool to the track. And if you forget one important thing, and that one important thing makes it impossible to drive for you, there's only one person to blame. You. If you're financially well equipped however, you might opt for a team to handle transport and maintenance in an arrive and drive arrangement. Although some might argue that the real fun lies in managing everything yourself. Assuming you've arrived at the track in one piece and assembled your cart correctly, the entire day lies ahead of you. This time is yours to explore and optimize. You can tweak the setup, experiment with different parts, work on improving your driving skill and focus on anything that could potentially shave off precious seconds, tens and eventually hundreds of your lap time. When you're just starting out, it is important to not do too much with the setup. It is vital that you first learn the basics of driving a car with its unique driving characteristics. For your first few days, I recommend that you run the chassis on the standard setup, only tweaking your tire pressure and gear ratios. Once you do start to delve into the world of kart setups, you'll find out that it is a deeply complex and counterintuitive world. Every setup change on the kart will basically only do one of two things. Increase or decrease the speed and amount at which the rear inside wheel will pick up going around the corner. With a perfect setup, the inside rear wheel will lift off the ground slightly on turn in, come back down to the ground in the mid corner and stay there on exit. You need that wheel off the ground to not get understeer on entry and on the ground on exit to get traction. You have a whole plethora of parts available to achieve this perfect setup. Different rims, rear axles, front wheel hubs, rear wheel hubs, torsion bars and so on and so on. Usually you'll just end up running the standard setup with only one or two minor changes though. It's essential to recognize that while setup modifications play a significant role, they're only a complement to the driver's skill. Even with the best, most overpowered tuned setup ever, a subpar driver might struggle to maximize its benefits. Therefore, continuous focus on honing driving skills is paramount, as the driver's proficiency remains a pivotal factor in achieving success on the track. At the end of the day, the routine continues as you return everything to the workshop for cleaning and maintenance. Disassembling and closely inspecting all parts for damages is a crucial step. Regularly conducting this thorough inspection ensures that your card maintains a pristine appearance for an extended period of time. Additionally, don't overlook the karting community. Engaging with fellow enthusiasts, joining clubs and making new friends can enhance your overall experience. The camaraderie and shared passion for karting can lead to valuable insights, lasting friendships and a deeper connection to the sport. Whether you're enjoying the simplicity of rental karting or navigating the complexities of owning your own kart, the world of karting offers a diverse range of experience for enthusiasts of all levels and budgets. There's actually another way to get in touch with the karting community right from home and that is by joining the channel's Discord server. In here you will find karting drivers from all over the world, all ages and budget levels. You can even find some actual race car drivers here who have promoted from karting. Join now, it's completely free and a great way to get some free knowledge. After several months of testing and gaining confidence in your technical and driving skills, you might want to step into racing, where things can get even more complex. Racing offers various options, from joining a team to going solo, trying an arrive and drive service or managing everything independently. For simplicity, let's just focus on participating in the National Rotex Max Championship. First, obtain your racing license, usually requiring a straightforward process like a small medical check and an annual fee for the National Motorsport Association. Next, prepare your kart for competition by replacing any slightly worn part to minimize the risk of component failure during the race. Consider joining a team for on-track support, shelter, a mechanic, the best setup, technical support and driver coaching. The best way of choosing a team is to base your choice on their track record. Simply give them a call expressing your interest, participate in the race and pay your bill and boom, you're part of a team. When you arrive at the track on Friday morning, you get one full day of free practice like usual. Try to use this time to learn from the quicker drivers and the coaching from your mechanic and team. You will always be out on track with drivers in the same class as you, so the machinery is more or less equal. Saturday is more or less the same, but now you'll have the driver's briefing, scrutineering of the cart and quality runs. In a quality run you put on a new set of tires and your race engine. You will do a short stint of about 4 laps in which you use the peak performance window of your new set of tires. This is the first session in which you can get a real idea of the pace of your competition. Then on Sunday, the real fun starts. You mount your race engine and go into the last practice session called a warm up, in which you Warm up. Then it's time for qualifying. 5 minutes to set a good lap time and find your track position. You'll find that having the right combination of slipstream and no traffic ahead of you is tricky to establish for yourself. Because that is what everybody is trying to do at the same time. Anyways, after you've qualified it's time for the pre-final. This is a 10 minute sprint race which is pure chaos from start to end. Racing and karting is unlike anything you will ever experience. 
The sheer amount of decisive action, strategy and planning it takes to be a front runner is unparalleled by any other sport. Not even in F1. And don't just take my word for it, take it from Ayrton Senna. And don't just take his word for it, but let the following clips speak for themselves. Lights go out and away they go, oh. down and towards turn number one. Great start from both the front rows, but through goes uh, Gus Lawrence and Higgins to the lead. And Gus go on the attack here and now looks to the inside as Higgins once again. And Guy Cunnington off the oh. track and he's going to get swamped by the pack. Now three wide and look at that. Kai Hunter on the inside. Gilbert comes through as well. And Matthew Higgins gets spat out of the field as now Jamie Perilli gets through. Anyways, after those 10 minutes of anarchy, the position you end up in will be your starting position for the final, which is basically the exact same race but then 13 minutes long. The result of the final will then be the result of the event. So if you finish third in the final, you will be third of the day. For the championship, however, the points collected in both the pre-final and final count towards the championship. If you end up finishing first or second in the championship, you'll get a ticket to the Rotex Max Challenge Grand Finals, which is basically the world championship for Rotex. The World Championship consists of just one race, cards are delivered by the organization and it's a pure spectacle to watch. But I digress, once the final is over and you finish in the top 3, time to collect your trophy. After which it's time to clean everything up, take your chassis apart so that you can transport it back and then hand in your race engine back to the team. As you might have noticed, so far I've made the assumption that you have rented a racing engine from your team. This is pretty much the only option you have if you want to have the same amount of power as the front runners. To show you this fact in effect, the footage on screen compares my best engine with a rental engine from the same engine supplier. But Red, you mentioned that these engines are sealed. How can there be such a significant performance difference from engine to engine? Well, excellent question. The answer lies in the nature of motorsport itself. Achieving complete equality in terms of equipment is virtually impossible. Some engines are inherently superior to other engines. But the more financial resources you allocate to engine research and optimization, the more room there is to enhance performance within the regulations. Just to give you an example, if Rotex introduces a new engine upgrade, Mass production means that if you buy 50 units, each one will be slightly different. If you were to have a big budget, you could decide to buy 50 units, subject them to dyno testing, identify the best performing parts, put these parts together and end up with two or three exceptionally quick engines and a few decent ones for testing. What happens with the rest of the parts and engines? Well, usually they are just thrown away. I think you can now start to see how acquiring the best equipment could cost hundreds of thousands of euros. And this is also where the less glamorous side of motorsports begin to emerge and we're only just scratching the surface here. Okay, so consider two individuals, person A and person B. Person A has a budget of 10,000 euros per year, while person B has a 25,000 euros a year budget. Both participate in a championship that costs 10,000 per year. Person A exhausts their entire budget just to compete, while person B has an additional 15,000 to invest in additional testing, racing, upgrades, research, coaching, and so on and so on. Now imagine that scenario and multiply the budget of person B tenfold. Those are the budgets that some front runners might have access to. This also means that they will not only be racing in the national championship, but also national championships of neighboring countries, club races, regional races, and international races. More often than not, they will also be running a brand new kart every two to three races. They will also be testing and training at least once or twice a week and have a race weekend pretty much every weekend. This is also why, more often than not, drivers with deep pockets appear to be the most talented. Not only because they can afford the best equipment, but also because they've spent the most time learning about the sport and perfecting their abilities. I would say that 95% of their good results are purely down to their work on skills, setups and perfection on their abilities. You could put them in a slower card and they would still be able to win. And credit where credit is due for the extreme amount of dedication to perfection which requires sacrifices in diet, social life, academics and so on and so on. In short, the more money you can spend on raising, the easier it is for you to reach your full potential. There are hundreds if not thousands of examples of kids who might be talented enough to reach the higher levels of motorsport but just don't have the funds to do so. This is also the reason why many people who just start out with karting give up on it after just a few years. And I have to say if you're new to the sport, this is completely understandable. As we look back at the ups and downs outlined in our last chapter, it's clear that karting faces some tough realities, especially when it comes to money and opportunities. Racing, as we've seen, isn't always fair, creating a situation where not everyone starts on an equal footing. But before we let these challenges get us down, let me quickly go over why these challenges are nothing compared to everything you'll gain from this amazing sport. First of all, facing the financial hurdles in karting is the first step towards unlocking its true magic. Instead of seeing these challenges as unbeatable problems, think of them as a part of the exciting journey you're on. It's about making your way, setting realistic goals and enjoying the ride with your budget, experience and time limits. 
Try to get as close to these big budget guys as possible and enjoy the process of trying. On a good day and with some luck on your side, you might even get close or in the best case, beat them. This not only makes you a better, more determined driver, but it helps you grow as a person. The setbacks, money struggles and the competitive nature of racing all help build a strong and determined individual. Standing up for yourself in tough situations becomes a skill you learn both on and off the track, showing how karting can shape you who you are. It teaches you to fight for the things you want and to create creative solutions to problems you can't initially solve. Karting is really just like a school for life. You become a mechanic, learning about your machine, racing skills become second nature to you as you get better on the track, and taking care of your kart teaches you responsibility and attention to detail. The skills you pick up, technical, mental and social, aren't just for racing. They help you in other parts in life too. I can pretty safely say that in creating my own business and YouTube channel, karting has taught me so much more than anything I ever learned in school. And if you do happen to have a big budget, push yourself as hard as you can. Try to use the budget that you have to break every record, set new standards and become the best driver you can possibly become. We must not forget what it's all about however, fun. The thrill of racing, the friendships you make with drivers, parents and personal growth you experience make the whole journey worth it. Karting isn't just about winning, it's about the experiences, the friends and the good feeling of mastering something challenging and rewarding. As well as proving yourself against the most talented, most wealthy and most experienced drivers, some of which we will see at the starts of Le Mans, F1 or IndyCar in some years from now. Also keep in mind that there is a racing class available for you at basically every price point. If Rotex is a bit too expensive for you, I strongly recommend considering the Tillerson T4 class. A full review on the Tillerson T4 can be found in the pinned comment. Also, if you can spend a little bit more on your racing, consider looking at KZ, OK or OK Junior or IAMI X30. These forms of karting are typically a little bit more expensive, but they provide an even greater and international challenge. By accepting the tough parts, setting your own goals and enjoying the adventure, karting becomes more than just a sport. It turns into a journey that shapes your character, teaches you useful skills and gives you the pure joy of racing. So yeah, that's pretty much the whole story of karting as I have experienced it over the last 14 years. If you're curious on how to start off in this amazing sport, why don't you check out this tutorial on how to start karting with zero knowledge. This video is done however and I'll see you all next time. Peace.